First of all, I'd like to say how wonderful this church is, where the bishops will sit for questions after the sermons. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Professor Van Dunn. Uh, it occurred to me that your talk uh, implied that the uh, non-aggression principle might not be sufficient for, or it might be too idealistic for uh, libertarians that lack a conscience or have uh, a conscience different than others in their group to, uh, to coexist peacefully or argue with each other uh, because of the varying consciences of, of that. And I think you, you mentioned it, you know, non, so many words, the non-aggression principle alone isn't enough. And I just thought, um, do you see that a, the role of a, a third party arbitrator would have any effect in solving that problem? Or how do you, how do you think that could be addressed? The, the principle is not enough in the sense that you can repeat it a million times if it is not received, if the people to whom you address it are not ready to re uh, receive it, to understand what you, what you mean, then it is, of course, uh, all in vain. That means that uh, you expect the people to whom you address your non-aggression aggression principle uh, to be educated along certain lines, right? And the, uh, the principle of education do not stop uh, by repeating, do not commit aggression. But you have to, cooperation is, not, is something else than not aggressing. And uh, the constructive part is uh, in the cooperation, the ways you cooperate and what you teach, for instance, your children. And the uh, non-aggression principle is something that can be added whenever uh, an enemy appears on the horizon, <laughs> but normally, uh, if the enemy is there before the friends are there, then nothing emerges at all. So everything that has to be defended uh, rests on different principles than merely non-aggression. Um, remember last year I talked about the bad neighbor problem, um, that you have people living next door to you and they have uh, sex orgies uh, that everybody can see, or uh, let's say they in, engage in necrophilia, which is also a non-aggressive activity, uh, or in incest or whatever, which is also a non-aggressive activity. Um, so there is far more necessary than only saying n no aggression defined in physical terms in order to have peaceful relationships between people living in close proximity with each other. Uh, my question is uh, for Professor Hopper. Uh, I haven't read Pinker, so I'm asking you uh, whether Pinker deals with the problem of making things look better uh, or worse according to the date from which you start uh, your analysis, so that, for example, my financial advisor can show that my investments are doing very well. Uh, just by choosing the uh, date at which he uh, starts. And does he deal with the fact that, for example, in the United States, it's been estimated that the homicide rate would be five times higher than it is if we used the same um, uh, surgical and resuscitation techniques as in 1960? And then if you consider that in 1960, They'd already improved uh, drastically. And by this means, you can show that the homicide attack rate in the United States has gone up by 100 times, if you believe the figures, uh, has gone up 100 times since 1900. Um, and at, at points in, in the 1970s, it was 200 times. Does he deal with that kind of problem? And what is the relevant point at which we compare our own lives with the past? Yes, he, do, he, he does look at 
various historical periods in European and American societies and claims that the number of homicides uh, sometimes goes up a little bit, sometimes goes down a little bit, but there is that the overall trend is at least what he claims in, according to his statistics is that there's a, there's a clear decline of homicide rates, there is a clear decline of um, uh, that is more pronounced in some societies, slightly less pronounced in others, but that is the overall trend in all societies which he uh, for which he has uh, collected data. Uh, also, the number of hangings, for instance, so number of hangings goes down, um, the number of uh, uh, people um, uh, subject to death penalty is, is going down. Um, he does admit that in certain uh, areas it also went up for a while, uh, points out certain factors that have reduced it again. Um, but the, his interest is to show l long run uh, developments. I don't know if I, if that answers your question or was your. Uh, well, it does answer the question about what Pinker does. I just dispute whether what he's saying is actually true and whether. Uh, whether any sensible person would fail to worry that the homicidal attack rate had gone up enormously uh, over the last hundred years by consoling himself that it's much better than it was in 4000 BC. Again, you see, what I said was I, t I take his data as he presents them. Um, I, I, I'm not competent enough um, to judge the validity of all the statistics that he gives. I try to show only that according to his own presented data, um, that does not make much sense. Um, I, have, I have doubts about many of the data that he presents. Um, but that would be an entirely different task for which I do not think I'm qualified to answer that because that w would require extensive historical research and I'm not a historian. Yeah, this is a question for Hoppe and either the other two if you like. Um, so it's, it's about the, or the ethics and their origins. So. Um, when you get to the bottom of libertarianism and Austrian economics, it comes down to the the, uh, the uh, non-aggression principle, self-ownership, and I'm just I'm, I'm and th where where do you think eth ethics come from? Do they have a spiritual origin? You know, you touched on the Bible a little bit today. This is a, a matter of religion used to address, but it still begs the question for me that what is the isn't there a spiritual root to to self-ownership and a right not to be invaded upon. I think what what Frank Van Dunn has pointed out, the foundation is to be found somewhere in the fact that we argue with each other uh, with the purpose of finding the truth. And of course, we must be unified uh, with other people by having a common conscience. Um, but you begin with arguing one person with another person with a specific purpose in mind. We want to resolve an intellectual dispute by peaceful means. Yes, there is. Of course, the, uh, the principles, uh, the principles as they are uh, established afterwards, by after all this argumentation, they become detached from the arguments themselves. But uh, you cannot do without ar the argumentation, and the argumentation has to uh, move within fairly narrow bounds of propriety, because uh, when 
blow to the head is enough to, to end the, the discussion. So in order to keep the discussion going and to keep uh, faith in the uh, results of arguing with one another uh, alive, uh, you have to have a certain spirit and the spiritual uh, attitude, right? moral attitude, if you will, has to be uh, developed in the course of, because you cannot presume it given, but it has to be developed in the course of arguing itself. So that is why argumentation is um, probably the, 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 the rarest of forms of exchange. Uh, I, distinct, I have distinguished it uh, earlier hmm, from negotiation and from intimidation and so on, but I would also uh, differentiate it from, for example, debates, right? Now, debates are plenty, <laughs> they're everywhere. Uh, but the idea of a debate is totally different from that of an argumentation, because in, an, in a debate, typically the speakers are trying to uh, persuade not the opponent, but the, uh, the passive element, uh, the, the audience or the judge, right? So the danger there is that they start uh, playing on the judges or the audience's uh, preferences or prejudices uh, rather than uh, responding to the opponent's arguments. So argumentation is very rare and you will find, you will not find an argumentation based morality uh, throughout history. That's why most uh, moral systems uh, stay very close to a, a, a very small circle, or a rather small circle of, of people, the tribe, for example. And then the anathema, uh, you are not to be one of us, uh, is, is, is rather strictly interpreted according to tri tribal uh, boundaries or to uh, uh, ethnic uh, boundaries. But what we see in Western uh, of course, there are other examples in the, uh, in the Far East, in the Western development of morality, is that there was this idea of the, the human person as such. Right. Right. Yeah, okay. I should put some flavor on it. <laughs> so, usually the uh, argumentation is possible only with like-minded people. And the, uh, the trick which was achieved in medieval Christianity, also already to some extent in uh, Roman Christianity before that, was that the, the range of acceptable uh, opponents in argumentation widened enormously. Mm -hmm. You could see that, for example, in Anselm's decision to include the atheist as a possible person to argue with. Right? This was no longer a person you should avoid or even kill. You could sit down and try to convince him with reasons uh, that he was wrong and that you were right. I add something. I also think that this approach by argumentation is a very helpful and, and convincing approach. Um, what I always like to do is to try to go even deeper and try to understand what is the phenom phenomenon as a natural social phenom phenomenon that discussions, argumentations about conflicts are going on. So this too is something to think about and so uh, I always think that you know w when you ask as a as a lawyer or as a, um, a scientist in law uh, sometimes the question comes up what is the law what, what is it of out of what is it made is it something a bit according to you questions that you you catch from heaven or comes it from inside bottom up or, or wherever does it come from. And I could imagine that a convincing answer or a consistent approach to this 
aspect is to to look at the behavior of people in society if conflicts happen what what happens uh, out of a conflict some reactions come up these are maybe just natural reactions actio equals reactio things like that um, and out of this maybe physical conflicts reactions come out shouting comes out argumentation comes out not in each individual situation but as a, a cultural development and so I can imagine that um, the ultimate basis of all these approaches including argumentation is the conflict as such the conflict produces its own solution it's um, a, a famous um, law a scientist in Germany Rudolf von Jering um, he put it very bluntly and said um, law this is revenge um, out of very archaic times of course this is a different kind of dealing with conflicts as we do but in the very core of the phenomenon it's the same and I could imagine that there it's where you have to find to search for the answer what is law and where does it come from I guess you know you can have a, an atheist could have a, a utilitarian argument for what for for morality or ethics and I'm, I'm just it still begs the question though I mean even though if you, you arrive at an argumentation it you know what what is right or what is true still you know you could come at it from a utilitarian way but it's it, it would still beg the question of like what, why do people think that there are things that are right and wrong or true or are or, or untrue or well, why is a violation of somebody wrong you know why is the theft wrong like it, it still begs the, the the greater question of why you know I, I guess I guess I what, what do, you, yeah. do you think do you think so, do you think there's more to it than than just a if I understand you correctly yeah. what you're look, looking for is that uh, even this level of of the question so w what is it are these moral principles and and what is this the moral principle and what is right and what is wrong what is just and what is unjust I think that is also something coming out of this conflict of the argumentation and is is not the beginning of it but is the end of it is the end of um, all what comes out of the conflict via these social interactions and finally things like morals like good like bad things like that um, emerge in society and become assets become elements become milestones within social interactions um. I don't think it is just conflict and there's a reaction to the conflict. Um, in order to resolve the conflict, you can also resolve conflicts by intimidation. You can also resolve conflicts by uh, using great rhetoric or whatever it is. No, the, the key is uh, the conflicts have to have to be resolved by purely argumentative means. Um, in that regard, I entirely agree with, uh, with Frank. Um, it is not, there's not some sort of automatic resolution of conflicts. Conflict breaks out and then there's a reaction and there's another reaction and there's another reaction and at the end of this the conflict is resolved. Um, there must be a common conviction that only certain means are permissible in order to uh, resolve in the conflict the conflict in such a way that it will be accepted by people as indeed a rational conflict resolution. So I, um, David tends to be, for my view, to be a little bit too naturalistic in in this uh, 
in this dispute uh, where we are more, yeah, can we say idealistic? Yeah, in, in, in a certain sense, uh, realistic, <laughs> in the platonic sense, realism. Uh, but I want, about this conflict thing, now conflict, my own very uh, childish and rudimentary analysis, conflict has a, a number of elements. Microphone. Uh, so, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, a conflict has different parties, at least two, right? It has a, uh, these parties have different views and purposes and goals. Hmm? There must be a common element. This is what Hans always uh, stresses. The common element is the scarce thing, the, uh, what is at stake in the, in the conflict. And the parties must have uh, free or equal access to that scarce thing. If one of these elements is missing, then there is no conflict uh, in the real sense. There is no clash of interest. So you always, whenever you have a, a conflict situation, you have four uh, logical types of solutions. One is you reduce the number of parties to one, okay? Or you uh, eliminate the uh, differences of opinion. You create a consensus. So in the first case, you uh, create unity out of plurality. In the second case, you create a consensus out of diversity and you can also uh, try to create uh, differential access so that one party can no longer access the, the scarce means which is the, uh, the, the element of the conflict. And when these new conditions uh, are established, the conflict disappears. It, it has no, no longer any ground. The fourth solution is you, you s simply eliminate scarcity, right? That's the utopian solution. <laughs> the utopian solution. Uh, but the, the, the problem is, of course, when you have this philosophical anal analysis that allows four types of solution, and there is one conflict, you will have a conflict among the different solution providers. So one say, no, we need a, a unity, that is a society, an ordered arrangement in which this conflict will disappear. Another says, no, 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 we need to build a consensus in which uh, the differences of, of opinion will disappear. Another will say, no, 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 we need a strict property regime and the differences will, uh, uh, the conflict will disappear. And then the utopians will say, no, 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 we need to make sure that everybody has plenty. Right. Uh, but these are meta-conflicts. They can arise from any particular individual conflict. So they, they are not, a conflict is not uh, a natural thing. It's, it's basically in the, in the, in the minds. It, it starts from the minds of people. And uh, the, the argument uh, finally, I, I would bring in Anselm here. Uh, you can think of conflicts in terms of magnitudes, that is clashing forces, or you can think of it in terms of uh, principles, ethical uh, positions. And of course you can never get an ethical principle from a clash of uh, forces. And that is the, the fallacy of Dawkins, that's the fallacy of uh, Pinker. Right? when he reduces uh, violence to the measurable aspects of certain acts and not the intentional things. I didn't quite understand, um, maybe I missed it, but why did we have the emergence of the state as the kind of global solution for the past 500 years? In other words, if we want to move uh, from the state back to something like the Middle Ages, we need to really clearly understand why did we leave the Middle Ages. If that was a better social arrangement, why did that not last? And why did we, for now 500 years, have a worse solution? Um, and you know, people like St Stalin and Hitler maybe took advantage of the existing state, but they also moved it even further 
uh, into the direction of um, uh, monop uh, monopoly and, and uh, serving their own means. So what is it about the environment uh, of the last 500 years that makes the state so resilient against uh, a better social, uh, like anarchic uh, situation? Maybe top because it it took a long time when only gradually occurred a, a feudal a feudal king uh, increasingly reaches a position of an absolute king with some of the previous institutions still remaining in existence and then you take the next the next step and the next step. I mean, to, to use an analogy, um, how did it happen that we have fiat currencies instead of hard metal? Um, you can see that there's a tendency that will go in that direction, but they didn't do it instantly. Uh, first you start with coin clipping. Um, then the next, the next step uh, will be you, you monopolize um, the mining of, of gold. Um, the next step is uh, you permit that um, uh, money substitutes will be introduced that are partially covered only by gold. Um, you still have uh, plenty of um, of uh, competition between different different uh, uh, people who um, uh, not mine but um, uh, make really gold coins out of out of gold. Um, then you have the tendency of those people realizing you cannot inflate as much as you want as long as there exists competition between different people who offer gold as money. Uh, then you have a central bank coming in, into existence, uh, which allows all people to do coordinated uh, inflation. Um, then you loosen um, the, the connection between um, uh, substitute money substitutes and and genuine money and and finally you break the link entirely so it was a long drawn out process uh, which maybe some people realized what their ultimate goal was um, uh, most people didn't but the next step was almost always clear that you had to take so you take one step and then it follows almost logically what the next step must be. And I imagine that the process that we have state formation out of a system that had no state proceeded in a very similar, in a similar way um, without any plan behind it except those people who wanted to acquire this power knew always this is the next step I have to have to take and then the next generation is like I know now what the next step has to be is this in order to reach um, reach the ultimate goal since I am uh, seated on the left of Professor Hopper <laughs> I will answer uh, slightly differently from what he uh, did because you asked about what brought the middle ages which were moving in the right direction what brought them to an end and I think the uh, the, the, the it, it has identifiable causes uh, and not just a drift, well, a well-intentioned drift uh, with dark sides that nobody appreciated, because the the Middle Ages ended with dark sides all visible, uh, and I think that the, the basic changes were the uh, uh, changes in weapons technology and the uh, advancement of, of trade. Trade being a cause of great uh, inequalities of wealth, uh, which led to great inequalities in armaments, uh, the ability to hire uh, mercenaries and so on. Uh, so it was a, a 
a physical rearrangement of forces that uh, broke the equilibrium and the church was not able even if she wanted to maybe she did maybe she didn't she was not able to uh, keep the new forces uh, under control for example uh, having authority over uh, landlords is one thing but having authority over rich traders is another thing because they are constantly on the move and they are constantly uh, making deals all over the place. They are negotiators, right? They are not arguers, traders. And then there was, of course, the, uh, the bucolic plague, which uh, was an, an enormous blow to the structure of the Middle Ages. Because here was a problem, uh, enor an enormous problem, caused apparently by nothing, so you had to say it was God, uh, an act of God. But the Pope was uh, absolutely ineffective against it and the kings were ineffective against it. So the two pillars of the uh, medieval order were, as it were, uh, called with their pants down, in a matter of speaking. And then there was the uh, uh, Byzantium, right? The Byzantine Empire that fell. And from the uh, 1440s, you had a constant in-stream of uh, refugees from uh, the Byzantine uh, borders. And these people were also very rich, and they brought an entirely new and <laughs> astonishing culture with them, artistic uh, skills that were unknown in, in the Middle Ages. So there was a, a fairly drastic uh, change in the material conditions and material conditions which nobody was able intellectually or materially to cope with so a lot of things began moving around and, and, and falling uh, and let the chips fall where they may well that happened uh, at that time now of course there were opportunities there and uh, Unfortunately, whereas the, the plague struck high and low, uh, the, the royal houses were the least struck of, of all, mostly. So the higher nobility was among the, the best placed to defend itself against the, the plague. And they were also, together with the merchants, they had the, the wherewithal to buy all the empty uh, estates that were available because the people there had died. So there was an enormous rearrangement of uh, political and economic power at the time. Yeah, I don't disagree with anything. I, I, I don't know why you said I'm sitting to the left of me, as if, if, as if that had some meaning. I don't think it <laughs> had. I liked very much uh, Professor Dew's presentation. They put on the timeline uh, the ascending power of state idolatry and the descending power of the uh, Catholic Church. Um, well, um, a few remarks. The first one is that the power of the state is limited only by, only by, thank you, uh, only by uh, competing powers of other states or by the resistance or the counter violence of the people. Uh, oppressed by uh, by a state, uh, the power of the church is rooted in a divine order. That means that it is always limited uh, because it has to refer to this uh, to the to the divine order. It cannot get out of control, and this is one aspect which has a lot of consequences. For instance, if we look at the election results in Germany in the in the 30s, uh, you will see that uh, in the Catholic countries of, in the Catholic lender of Germany, uh, the, uh, um, the people, the, the, um, uh, the people who, the percentage of people who voted for the Nazi party was much lower than in the Protestant parts of the country because the identification with the state uh, together with the missing link to Rome 
created or uh, uh, created another situation which was much more favorable for a totalitarian state. Second element is uh, punishment. Uh, the state, uh, if you want to leave the state, you are punished immediately. No? So they create the hell on earth. The punishment of the cat of the church also exists. It's a little bit delayed. Yeah? You will probably end in hell, but nobody has seen there really how it is. So it's delayed and uh, uh, you have no sanctions to fear uh, uh, on earth. The third point is, which is, I think, particularly interesting because it's mostly misunderstood. And that's the dogma of the infallibility of the Pope. What does it mean? It's generally in, uh, 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 interpreted as an expansion of the power of the Pope. But in reality, it's quite the contrary. It put e extreme limits to every pope because this infallibility is also in history. That means every pope who said something in uh, ex cathedra uh, cannot be contradicted by another pope afterwards. And that's probably one of the reasons, I think that, uh, that this was, is one of the reasons why the Catholic Church still exists while all other Protestant church simply uh, transformed in some kind of, of, of humanistic associations without, uh, okay, we don't talk about it. But in the Catholic Church, it's, uh, it's a wall against modernism. And I think it was the, up the, the, the most important contribution in the dogmatic de and doctrinal de uh, development of the Catholic Church was particularly this decision by uh, uh, Pius uh, uh, IX. Imagine if we had not the infallibility of the Pope. Imagine that Bergoglio could do what he wants. Imagine what the, the outcome of that. We would probably already have a female Pope, probably lesbian. Uh, we would uh, venerate uh, God as Mother Earth. We would probably had Corpus Christi on the same day as the Christopher Street Parade, yeah, and uh, we would have a Catholic Church with no difference to every other of the churches uh, who exists and who are completely victimized by modernization. Thank you. Yes, these are um, interesting um, additions. Um, I, I can follow all your your thoughts. Um, to, to take one point, you, you put in the first and in the third argument is the relation between church and power. Um, you said they legitimate their power from, from God, while states legitimate the power from elsewhere, democracy or state itself, whatever. Um, I think the, the most important um, aspect in, in this in this ambiguity between these two kinds of legitimation is not how is the power legitimized, but who has the power effectively. I mean, I could imagine that the fact that the church made out of this papal infallibility not a regime to dominate, you know, the world, but a regime to make the own faith, the own system of morals more consistent, um, more convincing perhaps for those that believe in it. Um, so this approach to these, to these legitimations is, was chosen not voluntarily, but because they did not have the power anymore. I could imagine that with the same dogmas, the church would have acted differently 300 years earlier when, when, when they had the power. So I think this is a, a very important aspect. While the state who took over, so to speak, the power, um, which was sort of, you know, secularization of the old church power into um, secular structures, um, there they found any legitimations, these states, to enforce their power. They had the power and 
the reason the legitimation is not that important anymore. They can argue with democracy, we know that God failed, or they can argue with, you know, natural law or the state as such, as the fascists did, the remark you, you told me before, quite explicitly. Um, maybe it's not that important. Much more important is that they had the power. Professor Hopper, you made passing mention of Hobbes, and I know that you've gone into further treatment on the Hobbesian myth. I'm wondering if you would summarize Pinker's work operating out of his depth as he was is just a empirical repackaging of Hobbes, and if so, if you could offer a further method or silver bullet to drive a stake through that Hobbesian myth. I think Pinker is even worse than Hobbes, because Hobbes does leave open the possibility that people can throw off the state if the state doesn't do what it is supposed what it is supposed to do pinker doesn't even has this aspect um, that at any point that there might be a point coming where you have to throw off um, this there are many contradictions in in pinker for, for instance he, he the American secession from England he somehow finds good um, even even though that is obviously a resistance against a state that contradicts his central thesis the guy writes in a way that he has a way to wiggle himself out of any type of objection um, th that you make because he always he hedges uh, this way and then he hedges this way so what I try to do here uh, was to um, to reduce the entire book to uh, the bare essentials um, and I'm sure that if Pinker would read something like this here but I also say this and I also say this um, but you can on he can only do this if he just simply forgets about what his central thesis is. Um, hedging your bets, I think he is quite good, uh, good at that, to avoid any type of criticism. Um, so, but again, uh, in that regard, he is worse, worse than whatever Hobbes says, because Hobbes does leave open the possibility, if the state doesn't do it, you are entitled to throw it over and go back to uh, state of nature. Um, I'd like to draw an uh, uh, unlikely comparison between two strange uh, travel companions, uh, meaning Martin Luther and uh, Machiavelli. And I'm thinking about the sola gratia principle and the prince. On one side, the Lutheran principle uh, legitimates the existing order and the existing princes who broke free from the medieval order of the of the pope and the emperor and on the other side machiavelli is the author of the definite separation between morals and states the prince has to pursue only power and it's uh, irrelevant if he acts morally or not or even more he should act immorally because this furthers the power of the state. Uh, what do you think about these two thinkers as at the beginning of modern states? Uh, well, th there are certain similarities and there are also very obvious differences. And the difference is that uh, Machiavelli uh, was n not someone who denied the possibility of uh, moral truth. Right? He, he simply said, or his main message, if you will, was that it does not uh, weigh heavily enough in the, the decision-making of, of princes uh, to play a role. But he was not saying what Luther was saying, that it is impossible uh, for human reason to come to any uh, reason judgment about right or wrong. These qualities are certainly uh, possible, but they are not effective in, note this, not just in politics, but in a uh, competitive political environment. 
because that is the, the point of the prince. The Machiavellian prince is a competitor. He is not a ruler from the ruling house, the 17th in a row, eh? uh, secure on the throne. No, he's, he's somebody who has to acquire power and maintain it. So his whole thinking is that of a entrepreneur, so to speak, in a market, rather than that of a, a ruler who has to sit tight and quiet and rule, that is, uh, judge, and be the judge and be the protector of the realm. But the Machiavellian prince has to make power and he has to use it to, and that is the great difference, I think, with the uh, medieval uh, scheme, he has to use it to govern. Because medieval, uh, medieval rulers did not govern. They ruled, but they didn't govern, right? Uh, and this was in the 19th century, French liberals picked it up. Le roi gouverne, uh, le roi règne, mais ne gouverne pas. Hmm? This difference between ruling and governing. But with, if you now go to, to Luther, for him there is no possibility for corrupt human reason to find principles of right and wrong. So the, the secular. Uh, replacements are power and wealth right? power and wealth rule and the uh, the only way in which morality enters is through the Bible but the Bible does not change anything except it adds a few words hmm? to the uh, to the human situation but it does not change the dynamic of the of the human situation and the uh, both Luther and Machiavelli were opposed by the Catholic Church, uh, which held the, the notion that it was possible, since human beings are persons and persons are minded bodies or embodied minds, uh, it is possible for persons to act according to ideas, consequently also according to the right ideas. And this was a, a moral duty, therefore, a, a perfect duty to do right. And this was missing both in Machiavelli and in, the, in Luther. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, this is a question to the panel um, going into the future now. So obviously state is accumulating more and more power and um, looking back there is a dynamic that probably could not be foreseen. Uh, the same applies for the future but one thing should be sure that this accumulation of power of the state as, as uh, you showed um, will come to an end. Uh, because there is probably just one law that there will be change. So uh, there is not just to be thought of more of the same. Of course, we can now prolong this in the future. It will continue to accumulate power. It will, it will uh, be richer. It will be more powerful. People will become more cursed or poorer but this will come to an end. Can, can the panel comment on scenarios, uh, how it will come to an end and uh, have a very patient outlook to the future as we are all sharing very low time preference? I think the two most likely scenarios are, the one is we have to radically decentralize. Um, all these global system will fall apart uh, due to internal rivalries, which are even promoted nowadays, in particular through the immigration policy, making societies more and more heterogeneous, creating more and more conflicts. One way out of that is, of course, the separation of of different smaller units that do it their way. The other um, scenario 
that I see is likely is that we have, that we will get a hardcore dictatorship. Um, once uh, the problems that exist in the current societies, like paying for pensions, um, uh, all the free goodies that the welfare state has promised, that that cannot be done, um, that you then have to resort to truly violent measures, even in the pinker sense, uh, violence. Um, so dictatorship, I think, is one possibility, uh, and the other one is, if you want to avoid that, would be decentralization, the session, breaking up of states. That's what I see as the two most likely scenarios. And I hope, of course, for the decentralization solution and fear that um, the dictatorship solution uh, is a very real possibility. I would like to add perhaps another scenario too, which goes a bit in that direction of that that um, dictatorship. It is, you know, the world state. It's just, or maybe that was your idea, not national or European or something like that dictatorship, but world dictatorship. I think that when you ask how when you say it will come to an end, I, I would also think that I mean, dinosaurs also came to an end. Um, so that this tendency will come to an end. So there are in principle two variants. It comes to an end um, in the direction of decentralization that this tendency toward monopolization of power would, would stop, would fall apart, would, would um, die of some virus, some libertarian virus. Um, but I think it's also possible that it will come to this apocalyptic um, scenario of a world state. I think there are many, many signs that show in that direction. N not this conference, of course, but uh, m many other signs. And I would say it's not irrealistic that this scenario happens. It's not very promising, but I would say not impossible. And at the very least, it's necessary to, to keep that in mind, to, to be aware that this is a very dramatic situation in which we are. And once we want to take some influence by conferences like that, by, by, uh, by you know, making this kind of, of thinking and of communication and so on, um, that, that we have this danger. And uh, so it's, it's really something to do. Um, I could, with this general view, uh, imagine that it's almost impossible to define a program and say, okay, let's make this or that in order to, to try to change this, this, um, this history. Maybe these are that important elements of human evolution that actually one cannot influence them really, but only um, look at them, try to, to give some, you know, um, uh, kick in this or that way, um, try to support tendencies if they are, if, if there are tendencies in that decentralized direction. But, but finally, um, it could be that, you know, in a thousand years at another conference, they look back and say, oh, that, that was fine. And uh, ultimately, it didn't go that wrong um, as one thought it could go. Um, suddenly, this libertarian virus went everywhere and these big structures for, fell apart. Maybe it's like that. And I would, of course, very much welcome it. Of, of course, I see a tendency to create a world state, but I think that is not in the short and intermediate run. I don't think that will happen. And if it happens, th then it will also by ultimate violence. And there has to be some sort of super dictator who brings it 
brings it about. Um, you, you first have to destroy all sorts of nationalist, regional uh, uh, affiliations in the in, uh, in attitudes among people. Yes, they try, I mean, I see the European development in this way that they tr nationalism might have been a bad thing in the 19th century, 19th century and nations were partly created also by conducting war. In this day and age, uh, nationalism is actually a good force in, in my view because it prevents this tendency to create um, a world state, whatever larger states, and those people who want to bring about a world state, and there are, of course, organizations with mighty people who work in that direction. Um, what they do is, of course, try to destroy all regional affiliations, all national affiliations, um, by creating artificial heterogeneity uh, in Europe. I think this importing all of these people from strange places into Europe is of course a way to yeah, eliminate, let's see, the feeling of Germans. We are Germans, we, we are not, we have something to do with other countries in Europe, but, but still we are Germans. We do not want to be run by, by Brussels. Um, the, the more heterogeneous societies become, the easier it is to centralize. Um, but the centralization also needs dictatorial powers. So I, I still think that I perfectly agree that there is this tendency and that is uh, a long run possibility that that might happen. But in the short run, I think the alternatives will be either there will be decentralization or there will be dictatorship. Well, I, I do not have a separate or even blacker uh, scenario, but uh, I would like to add to the, the hopefulness that comes out of decentralization, the, uh, I would add the question what does decentralization mean in the age of Facebook and Twitter and things like that, where the uh, institutional uh, decentralization may be uh, complete, yet the, the thinking could be uh, not more uniform than if it had been a completely uh, institutionalized centralization. So uh, even institutional decentralization in an age of uh, ultra-fast uh, communication of nonsense <laughs> and wrong-headed ideas uh, may not be uh, of great help. But I'm a pessimist. <laughs> um, I've got a, a brief question to Professor Van Dunn. I wonder if you could comment uh, in a bit more depth than you managed um, I know your text goes into a bit more depth, but uh, on the reintroduction of Aristotle and the uh, around the height of late Middle Ages and the effect that that had on Western thought. Yeah, well, uh, I, I did not uh, go into that at length in the, my, my uh, lecture, but I think that's an important thing and it's, of course, uh, a vital question, considering that uh, Catholicism, when you talk about Catholicism, people never seem to go back beyond Thomas Aquinas. Of course, there was a lot before Thomas Aquinas. Uh, but what he did, apart from being a wonderful uh, genius of a man, and what he produced in a very short time, you. He did so in, in a rather limited philosophical way. That is, he, he married Christianity to uh, Aristotelianism. And Aristotelianism does not really lend itself, in my view, uh, to a, a Christianization project. The reason which I mentioned, I, I believe, was that uh, if nature, all of nature, everything moves towards its end, 
from the inside, why do you need a church and why do you need a Christ? Because these are the people who show the way. They, they are the, and uh, they would be uh, irrelevant if the, the way was always, uh, as it were, built in. If everyone had his own uh, GPS uh, system and automatic steering towards the goal to be reached. So the uh, idea of Christianity, as Thomistic Christianity, in my view, severely weakened uh, the church not very long after Thomas, with his Aristotelian ideas, was accepted as a positive genial, genius contribution to the church because uh, he died in the in the uh, 1270s, right? And he uh, and the the plague struck about <coughs> 60 years after. The, the plague was uh, 1348, I believe. Yeah. So in that short period, when Aristotelianism was being established as the official not yet quite official, but as the, the strong contender for the doctrinal identity of the church, an event occurred that made it very delicate for the church to accept Aristotelianism because suddenly now this was part of providence. This plague, this disaster was a providential act. It was no longer something in nature that Christians would have to cope with. No, it was a providential act. And I think that was a very uh, difficult thing to, to explain to people who have lost all their relatives and, and, and all their belongings. And a lot of uh, theological energy went into explaining that uh, these things are really at bottom in ways that we do not understand good because Aristotelian ideas everything is good. The uh, previous theology, the Anselmic theology, was not everything is good. That doesn't mean nature is bad, but nature is neutral. Right? And things can happen in the family, in, in nature, in the woods, in, 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 in the water, in the, in the sky, uh, which have no moral significance, but you have to cope with them as moral beings. So there you have the uh, pinpointing of the, the fortitude or the Christian meekness, the ability to stand up to whatever happens, uh, lies with man. Right? It is not some sort of divine scenario in which the, the good things will be revealed at the end. Right? Meanwhile, millions of people die within a couple of months, but that's okay. Um, so first of all, I very much agree with your analysis of the evil that the state represents. Um, and there are very few people in the libertarian movement who can criticize the state as pointedly as you do. Um, but how would we, um, I, or how would you ensure that uh, the state won't reemerge once we've managed to abolish it? Uh, because uh, I'm specifically thinking of the high numbers of psychopaths and narcissists in executive positions in all sorts of organizations in society. Um, so just to give you a number, 21% of all CEOs are, com um, are like a recent study showed, are uh, psychopaths or have personality disorders as compared to only like 2 to 3% um, of the general population. And so these people are simply much more functional and capable to handle high pressure situations and stress than uh, us normal people, but they're also willing to stop at nothing if necessary. So wouldn't these people simply gather and through some sort of secret society or collusion take advantage of, of us normal people again? And wouldn't that bring back another um, evil rule again over time? Um, so how would a private libertarian community protect itself? against such uh, sociopaths that have obviously been ruling the world for centuries now. And uh, isn't the competition of crooks, um, the Wettbewerb der Gauner, like you call it, 
uh, isn't that a much larger problem than just within politics? I, I think there is, there is no guarantee that s such a thing uh, will happen. But at least, <laughs> to use one of the phrases of uh, Mayor Ross, but, but at least you might have had a, a glorious holiday. Um, <laughs> and in, in the end, we will we get that again. Um, also, these small communities that I mentioned, for instance, yes, of course, it, they have to protect themselves too, and the protection cannot always occur only with the people in, involved in these com community alone. You must also have alliances um, with similar thinking communities, arrangements that you help each other, something that we can learn in a way from, from the Middle Ages without imitating that exactly. There existed, of course, all sorts of alliances, but overlapping alliances. Some people were aligned with that. Some people were aligned with that. They were aligned, again, with a third party or a fourth party and so forth, which makes it very difficult um, to create uh, uh, a powerful enough opponents of, uh, of a free society to eliminate them. Uh, so forming alliances um, that might be not neighboring communities, but uh, maybe distant ones, um, would, be a, would be a way to reduce this danger. Uh, there is no, there is no clear-cut recipe uh, how you can eliminate this this danger totally. That is part of mankind with which we have to live. But as I said, um, uh, it might work for a while, and that might be worth it. And uh, and um, and in the end, we get something again like we have right now, but to, but to say um, that because that danger exists, we rather stay with the current situation, that seems to be a strange answer. Um, that is like um, uh, committing suicide um, because you are afraid of dying later on. <laughs>